Well, Merry Christmas. You know, believe it or not, it's still the Christmas season, even though some people have begun to take down their decorations and maybe have done it already. In the church, it's still the Christmas season. In the liturgical calendar that the lectionary follows, it's, as we've said, the second Sunday of Christmas. And tomorrow, January 6th, is actually the Feast of the Epiphany. Now, what happens is not a lot of people, especially in this country and culture, are going to go to church to celebrate tomorrow as well. It's, you know, it's enough when our kids go, we got to go in two weeks, you know, what, twice in a week, I mean, uh, when Christmas falls on a Thursday or Friday or something. But in many cultures, in ancient cultures, the Epiphany was a huge feast. In fact, it was almost bigger at some points in, in early Christian history than Christmas itself. And we'll get into kind of why that is. But we're, what we're going to do is kind of weave that into today's uh, uh, celebration and some of the readings, the optional readings, the gospel I'm going to read in a couple of minutes, uh, do that. It uses the one for the epiphany because today is really kind of the big uh, ending to the Easter season, uh, the Easter season, the uh, Christmas season, as far as most people go. I'm jumping ahead, right? Uh, and tomorrow, of course, begins ordinary time, right? So it's a whole transition thing that we're doing here. So let's uh, stand together and pray uh, one more time and listen to the gospel. Lord, in this season, when we celebrate your word become flesh, your love made real in our everyday lives, help us to open up to the wisdom and to the power of you leading us nowhere but Bethlehem and what that means as it meant for the three wise men who were led there by the star. And we ask this through the Word made flesh, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's listen to a reading from the good news according to Matthew. You can sit if you want. <laughs> After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, in the land of Judah, are by no means the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me that I too may go and worship him. After they heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So what is this, this thing called the epiphany? What does that even mean? Well, the word comes from Greek, which means appearance or revelation or unveiling, uh, being, being clearly made manifest so that everyone can see without a doubt. That's how clear, like a shining light, this thing is, whatever it is. So the epiphany is really the fullness of Christmas. Because the idea in celebrating it and the, and the theological idea is that not only has Christ been born, 
for us, but he's appeared to us. We see him. He's been made clearly manifest to us. We get it. We, we're awakened to the mystery of who God really is, that he's become flesh, that he's become one of us. To radically believe that, he has become one of us. That's how real he is. And this epiphany was uh, expressed in different ways in different Gospels. In the first Gospel historically written, which was not Matthew but Mark, uh, there is no infancy narrative or birth story of Jesus. He sort of comes out or is made clear, made manifest at the moment of his baptism. And this is an ordinary moment. Jesus is just coming among the other sinners, the other repentant people coming to John to be baptized and lets himself be baptized. Very mysterious kind of thing. And it's at that moment that the heavens open and the voice says, this is my beloved son. In the last, go- oh, in the last was that me or you? <laughs> you playing with me again there? <laughs> okay. In the last gospel written, which is John, there's also no infancy narrative. And Renee preached on this last week about the, the sort of theological mystery of the word made flesh and so forth. But he actually uh, comes on the scene at a very ordinary event, a wedding reception in a little village of Cana. And this is where Jesus performs his first miracle. So that's his epiphany in John's gospel. Luke and Matthew had the infancy story, and in Luke, he appears first to poor, simple shepherds. We're getting them a sort of pattern here of ordinariness. And in the gospel, we just heard to these wise men, these magi. First, a little note on who these guys are. I'm not going to get too much into this, but it's kind of like, who, who are the magi, right? First of all, they're not kings. We three kings, forget about it. They're not kings at all. But they were probably in service of a king. And some scholars say they probably came from Persia, uh, where they uh, had the religion of Zoroastrianism, which was a monotheistic or one-god religion. So they worshipped the one god, and they were very attentive to uh, what signs this one God may be giving. And one of the, the instruments that they use, as strange it is, as it is to us, was astrology. Same kind of astrology that goes on today. And not to say God approves of this, but he certainly used it right, to get them there. Right? We'll get into that. So the, these magi were probably uh, astrologers in the, in the king's court to kind of read the signs and the stars uh, to... to give the king advice, right? A divination, that sort of thing. So that's who these guys are. So, you know, we, we like the Magi, you know, a lot of times look for these big, huge signs, don't we? As we journey through our life. We look for God to sort of like, everything he does, he does it big, you know, that type of thing. Uh, and that's okay. God uses these things to get our attention. But at the end of the day, at the end of the journey, it's all about the simple. It's all about the ordinary. It's all about the everyday. It's about the human. That's where it's at for God, clearly, as he comes among us. That's the place of the word made flesh. That's where love gets real. That's the place of ordinary love. And I want to reflect on this idea of ordinary love a bit this morning. First, we're going to see a little video about it and then get into it a bit. I love that line. Uh, that's the refrain there. We can't fall any further, meaning sort of in deep love with God, with others, with life, if we can't feel ordinary love. And we can't reach any higher if we can't deal with ordinary love. What does that look like? What, what kind of picture can we put in front of our minds? And just as the wise men brought three gifts to Jesus of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, this wise guy this morning wants to put kind of three images before our minds that sort of mirror those gifts. The gift of gold was a kingly gift. It was saying that Jesus was king. But what kind of king do we find Jesus to be? 
except one who serves, one who gives his life ultimately on the cross. And there are hundreds of ways each and every day that we too, with Christ and in Christ and because of Christ in us, can exercise that kingship, that leadership of service in our own lives, ways that we can proactively live our lives in service of others. One day, my wife Joanna uh, was pulling up in front of the house and probably a busy, normal, ordinary day, just happened to notice a neighbor across the way, an elderly woman by the name of Ines, uh, struggling with her groceries. And she stopped and went over and helped her in with the groceries, helped her put them away, chatted a little bit, etc. Now, I say that story, and like all the stories I'm going to tell, they're not ones that are going to make us go, wow, you know, oh, wow. And I don't want them to be, right? I want them to leave us going, yeah, I've seen that in my life. I can do that. That's, that's not such a big deal, and I'm sure Joanna would agree. It's not a big deal. It's generous. It's open. It's sensitive. It's tender-hearted, and so is she but it's ordinary, right? It's all around us if we just kind of stop and open our eyes. Second gift of frankincense. This was a gift offered incense to divinity in all cultures, right? God, be they gods or one god, right? Incense was a way of of giving honor, prayers going up to God, etc. So the wise men bring this gift of frankincense. So sometimes real ordinary love in the divine sense the sense of feeling a deep love connection with God. We, we often think this stuff is out of our reach, but it's not. It's right there, literally, on the street. In 1958, on a cold March day, uh, a young monk by the name of Thomas Merton, and many of you have probably read his books or heard of him, uh, experienced what he would call later on an epiphany when he wrote about it. And he says this in his journals. In Louisville, at the corner of Fourth and Walnut, in the center of the shopping district, I was suddenly overwhelmed with the realization that I loved all these people. That they were mine and I was theirs. That we could not be alien to one another even though we were total strangers. It is a glorious destiny to be a member of the human race. You know, I often think Christ came into this world with something like that on his lips. Not like, ooh, I'm going to step into your, your world and uh, I'll do it. Okay, I'll do it, right? I mean, imagine if we treated each other like that. He longs to be one of us, to be made flesh. It's a glorious destiny to be a member of the human race. And he affirms our humanity by becoming man. So Merton goes on to say, it's a glorious destiny to be a member of the human race. How do you tell people that they're all walking around shining like the sun? This is what he's feeling. And he goes on to write, I suddenly saw the secret beauty of their hearts, the depths of their hearts, where neither sin nor desire nor even their knowledge of themselves can reach the core of their reality, where every person is known by God as God sees them. If only they could see themselves as they really are. If only we could see each other that way all the time, there would be no more war, no more cruelty, no more hatred, no more greed. Now, it's kind of an interesting paradox that Merton himself experienced that that transformation not in the everyday of his monastic life or routine, but in the everyday hustle and bustle of the shopping district, or what we might call today the mall. You know, I almost picture him standing in front of one of those mall maps, you know, with all the stores, and there's that one sign that says, you are here, right? That's what it's all about. You are here. And to stand there and be there, and to see, open your eyes and see what's going on around you, and more importantly, who's around you. Because it's when we're present like that, simple, ordinary street corner, 
that we can experience this communion with God, with others, with ourselves. So the gift of frankincense. And finally, the gift of myrrh. This is an interesting one because myrrh is a bitter, is it spice or herb? You know, okay, Joanna's going, oh my God, <laughs> calling on the biologist here. Uh, whatever it is, it's bitter, okay? And it symbolizes Jesus' humanity and especially the suffering of his humanity. And it's an interesting gift because, you know, it's like it's not exactly something you show up at a baby's birthday with. Here are some bitter herbs. You know? I mean, this is like, okay, what's this all about? But it symbolizes the suffering of Jesus. And I think that's a mystery because that is a place where we really sometimes experience in a very deep way, this ordinary, real love. The other night I was out with a couple of friends of mine, and one of the guys, we're going to call him Bob, and we'll call his wife Sally. That's not their name. But, uh, so Bob uh, is talking about, you know, uh, he, at, at home sometimes he'll make lunch for the kids, okay? Like uh, if he's off from work or he works from home a couple days a week, that's the scenario. And he makes lunch for the kids so his wife can kind of do a different routine and so on. But the other day, and she's got this kind of habit of doing this, Sally does, but the other day it was really strong. She kind of comes down and, even though he's done this a million times, like hovers over him, right, and says, uh, you know, he gets the chips, and you know, sees people poking each other, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, he gets the chips, and no, don't give him that, and he doesn't like that, and, and he, he looks at her, you know, this is like six in the morning, so he looks at her and goes, thank you, Mary. Now, Mary is Sally's mother, Okay. Now, so, so you can start to piece this together. Now, Mary has a habit of doing this to Sally whenever Mary visits the house, and Mary doesn't like it. And it's not just sort of a surface thing, but it gets into a real mother-daughter thing that there's some baggage there, right? Uh, so that was, and he knew what he was doing. So it wasn't just like, okay, Mary, ha, ha, ha. It was, you know, twist, you know, stab and turn kind of thing. Now, later on that day, of course, she walks away hurt, obviously, and he's kind of guilty but doesn't want to admit, yeah, I was just making the sandwiches and so forth. Later on, he gets an email from her, and she's apologizing. Now, I think that's kind of amazing in and of itself because she could simply hold on to that stuff and say, well, you know, she could hold on to it for days, who knows how long. But she took that step to apologize because she re realized, yes, I was wounded, but when people jab they don't just jab. Most of the time they're jabbing back, or at least it's a back and forth kind of thing. And she had the wisdom, the humility, the tender heartedness to take that first step, which of course led to him you know, emailing her back or calling her and saying, yeah, I'm sorry. And he, was, he, he even quoted a line from this song, which is why I got the inspiration to, to show it, where it said, I can't, we can't fight with each other. It's you I'm fighting for. Like, we can't do this. We're on the same side here. And it was a beautiful moment. But you know what? That moment was a gift. It wasn't despite that bitter myrrh of that moment. It was because of it that they opened up in a more vulnerable way to each other, in a more intimate way, and were even closer. Now, that's a mystery. But it's true, and we know it's true. So even those moments can be a gift it's not some extraordinary thing way out there. It's ordinary, ordinary love. He called it a God moment, and it was. Some people like to say in those moments, God showed up. I like to think we show up, right, to God who's already there, to a love that's already surrounding us, and we show up, and we experience that epiphany. So as we celebrate this epiphany, it kind of abruptly ends the Christmas season. Like, this is it. You know, not to say you have to take down your stuff today, but this is sort of it. It's the last day of Christmas. And we're back to ordinary time. It's almost like the liturgical calendar is sort of thrusting us right back into that everyday, ordinary life. And something in us balks at this. Something in us does not want this. As much as we get the message, the Word has become flesh, He's born in simple Bethlehem, and all these things, we just don't want to let go of this idea that somehow it's got to be bigger than that. 
right? We get to the holidays, and instead of just enjoying them as they are, we want to make it special, right? We're going to make a moment or something, right? Instead of just letting it be. And when we get to the end, nobody wants it to end. How many school kids were like, yay, we're going back to school right? the other day? No, nobody wants to go back, even though we know that's where it's at for God. And that's where we find him most. And I think that's the most profound epiphany or the most profound message that we can take away from this day. Not to be following false stars, right? Things that lead us to sort of a false happiness or bliss or peace. We're always looking for stuff somewhere else. It's like, it's like Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz looking somewhere over the rainbow, right? When the lesson of that movie and the lesson of the gospel is it's always right here, that there's no place like home the Bethlehem of our everyday, ordinary life. So whether it's being present to a neighbor in need, whether it's opening our eyes and seeing the fellow travelers around us in all their glory sometimes, even in the mall shopping, or whether it's reconciling with the people we love most in this world, what's the thing that's going to keep us awake to that? What's the thing that's going to open our eyes to those epiphanies. Well, I can't tell you what it is for you. But I can tell you this. If you search in any other place than where that star is leading, which is the here and now of Bethlehem, you're wasting your time because you ain't going to find it. Look right in front of you. Look in the every day of your life where Christ is wanting to lead you deeper in love with him, deeper in love with other people. That's what it's all about. As the mall sign says, you are here. We are here. And the call, I think, is to be here ever more deeply. As T.S. Eliot, the poet, said, we shall not cease from exploration. And the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and to know the place for the first time. Amen.